We thank you for this beautiful day, for the beautiful weather you've given us, in fact, the last two or three days, and just the opportunity to be able to be here alive and in enough health to be able to, to gather together. And we pray, Lord, you might just give all of us a special blessing, as your word is promised, to, to be together as we hear your word and, and encourage one another and share blessings and sing hymns. But Lord, we thank you that even in the struggles that we've gone through, that we can depend on you to supply our need. And Lord, we bring all the requests before you today and commit it into your hands. And we just want to praise you for the blessings and the answers to our prayers now and both in the future, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. My message, whenever I preach, is to try to help you. I'm not here to try to impress you or try to let you realize what a great speaker I am. If you, don't, if you walk out of here today and you haven't learned anything, I failed as a preacher, I failed as a teacher. Uh, I want you to be able to leave today uh, having learned something from the Bible, being a better Christian, a closer walk with the Lord. And so the purpose of my message is to try to, uh, of course, uh, have you learn something, also to help keep you awake. So once in a while I might uh, uh, tell you a funny story or uh, my wife said, please don't tell any of those jokes today. The Bible is the greatest book that on, on the earth. Did you know that the, the most published book in the world today is still the Bible? Even with the internet, uh, Shakespeare, uh, we still have the Bible as the, the greatest and most printed uh, uh, literature of today. Uh, and when we all stand before the judgment seat of, of Christ and the whole world before the judgment throne of uh, the, the great judgment, every man will not have, they'll have no excuse because they say, well, God, we didn't know where to find the answer. We didn't know uh, about uh, the gospel or, or the truth of Jesus Christ. We have it printed in almost every language in the whole world today. And uh, it's uh, missionaries throughout the world. So uh, we have the opportunity to be able to, to be a part of that uh, today. Uh, the message today that I'm bringing is, is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. If you want to turn there, it's, it's toward the very end of the Bible, a few books before the, the last book of the Bible, Revelation. You have Revelation, and you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then you have 1st and 2nd Peter. And we're going to uh, look at the last written words of the Apostle Peter here in 2nd Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And I was, I was telling our, our Sunday school teacher this morning that the lesson today actually mentioned part of my message. I said, boy, isn't that amazing how the Sunday school lessons kind of coincide with the message? I didn't even know what the Sunday school lesson was going to be on today. And it actually mentioned three or four lines of my message right there. I have, I have my message typed out and printed and right, almost quoted word for word my message right out there. Wow, isn't it amazing how, how that could happen? But, you know, God knows what he's doing. So I'm going to read the scriptures, follow along, and then we'll have a prayer, and I'll get right to the message. I'm not a long-winded preacher, even though if you talk with me, you say, boy, he, he has the gift of gab. Uh, my wife and I uh, spent our honeymoon over in Ireland, and she, uh, we were, she was kind of sick on the day we were supposed to go up to, the, up to the castle where the Blarney Stone is. That's supposed to be, if you kiss the Blarney Stone, you get the gift of gab. My wife said, honey, please don't kiss that Blarney Stone. <laughs> You already have, but, and I got, I all went to the tower, she was six, she was, she stayed down below, and I looked up there, and I was in line, and I said, my poor, poor w new wife down there, I better not kiss that stone, she said they don't need it, so I went back down again, <laughs> so I, I haven't kissed the Blarney stone, I promise you, but, but my message is normally, normally around 30 minutes, I know, uh, I grew up in a Baptist church where the preacher used to preach for about two hours, so I'm used to like two hour long sermons. You know, we didn't get out to like one o'clock, <laughs> one thirty sometimes. So, uh, so, but if you fall asleep during my sermon, am I doing you any good? No, you're, you're gonna walk out not learning anything. So I can't be too long, but I can't be too short, but I have to make sure I give you what you need. So you walk out, you feel like you got something today. So follow along, just one scripture. We'll pray and then get right into the message. Uh, the scripture says, but grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these words that Peter penned before his death. 
we pray, Lord, you might speak to our hearts today as a message and help each one of us to truly grow in grace and a knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, you might speak to each heart and may it glorify your name, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. These are the last written words of the Apostle Peter before he was martyred or killed by the Roman government for being a Christian. Did you know that the Roman Catholic Church claims Peter to be their first pope? When in fact, he never was. I'm reading a, a quote from www.gotquestions.org about this uh, topic. Question, was St. Peter the first pope? Answer, the Roman Catholic Church sees Peter as the first pope upon whom God had chosen to build his church. It holds that he had authority over the other apostles. The Roman Catholic Church maintains that sometime after the recorded events of the book of Acts, the Apostle Peter became the first bishop of Rome and that the Roman bishop was accepted by the early church as the central authority among all of the churches. It teaches that God passed Peter's apostolic authority to those who later filled his seat as bishop of Rome. This teaching that God passed on Peter's apostolic authority to the subsequent bishops is referred to as apostolic secession. The Roman Catholic Church also holds that Peter and the subsequent popes were and are infallible when addressing issues ex cathedra for the position and authority as pope. It teaches that this infallibility gives the pope the ability to guide the church without error. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it can trace an unbroken line of popes back to St. Peter citing this as evidence that this is the true church since according to their interpretation of Matthew 16, 18, Christ built his church upon Peter. All right, so that means that, folks, I'm sorry, we're not in church today. We're just in an assembly because we're not in the right church. Uh, But far from that truth, we're going to see today from the scriptures not just about Peter being the first pope or not, but about growing in grace. Did you know that there is no private interpretation of the scriptures of God? So what do you mean, no private interpretation? There is only one public interpretation. How many of you took chemistry class when you went to high school growing up, or, or maybe now? All right, when you were in chemistry class, you had to have a hypothesis, you had to have all these different tests of different uh, uh, chemicals and and procedures. When all the students got done with their experiment, did they all come up with different results from using those different chemicals? No. Every single student, when they got done with their testing, guess what? They all came up with the same exact result and that proved a certain fact. Did you know that the reason why there's so much confusion in this world today is because people have private interpretations. They have private interpretations. You say, well, that's what you believe, but I believe this. Well, that's what she believes. Well, I believe that. There's confusion because we don't take the time to properly analyze the scriptures like a chemist would to find out what the truth is. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There's only one public interpretation. So if you were to take any fact in the whole world about theology, and you were to analyze it by the scriptures, if you studied enough script, scriptures and cross referenced them and researched them, you would, no matter if you're here in America, in China, in Africa, in Europe, we'd all come up with the exact same conclusion because the Bible only has one truth. If it contradicts yourself, it has to be uh, a different answer because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. You say, well, what about that? Well, there might be some errors in translations. And that can be explained, but there's only one answer. So we're just going to look at this first, first of all, before we get into the message about Peter being the Pope, because I don't want to preach the message from Peter if, if, if that's not true. So let's see, let's see what the Bible says. First of all, please turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 42. We're going to see 
when Jesus first changed Peter's name, Peter is not his real name, did you know that? Some of you maybe didn't know that. His real name was Simon. His real name was Simon. Simon Peter. He got his name. Jesus renamed him later on. John chapter 1 and verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon. His name was Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is be, by interpretation a stone. You say, well, I thought you said his name was Peter. Well, Cephas is Aramaic, which was a language they spoke back then, but they also spoke Greek back then. They spoke Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and many other languages. Another scripture we're going to show you that is, is translated Peter from the word Petros. So here his name was called Cephas. So that's his, that means a, a stone or a rock. Right? So we see that scripture there. Uh, now turn back to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 was, is where the Roman Catholic Church gets uh, the notion that Peter was the first pope and that the church is founded upon the Apostle Peter. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, that I the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be loosed, or shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, if you were just to look at that one scripture and take it out of context, you would say, well, it certainly looks like Matthew 16 is saying that thou art Peter, and upon Peter the rock, he's going to build his church, and he's going to have the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That would certainly make it look like Peter was the first pope or the founder of the, of the church. But if you study more scriptures, you will see that, first of all, the text Peter means actually stone, not rock. How many, uh, well, you can look at the word pebble, the P-E-B, pebble, comes from the same root word of Peter, where you have uh, the two there. Peter was going to be one of the first building blocks of the church. Who was it that preached on the day of Pentecost and the first Christians were added to the church? Peter preached that sermon. Who was the one that preached the first sermon to the Gentiles at the house of uh, the, the centurion Cornelius? Uh, it was Peter that preached that message and the Gentiles were first added to the church. So Peter was a founding stone or a founding rock, but he was not the rock. He was not the foundation. Uh, Corinthians tells us and other scriptures tell us that no other man can lay a foundation other than Jesus Christ. He is our foundation and every other stone we, which we are, we're building blocks upon that church. So if you look at the scripture here and, 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 and cross-reference it, you'll see that the Bible does say that Peter is a, a stone or a rock, but he's not the rock or the foundation. And he, did, he was given a key to the kingdom of heaven for those opening salvation of the Jews on the day of Pentecost and those to the Gentiles with the first Gentiles being saved with Cornelius and his household. So we have to truly study the scriptures in the light of what they say and cross-reference them. In fact, Peter never claimed to be the Pope. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he claims only to be a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So I don't think Peter went about trying to say he was a pope. Now it's time for a little quiz, because I think a uh, few feel like you're kind of falling asleep over there and, and maybe need a little something to kind of keep you awake here. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 2 through 4, um, we have a list of the first 12 disciples of Jesus. 
These are the first 12. I'll read it for you, then I'm going to ask you some questions about them. All right? So in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 10, it says, Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, that's our, our subject today, and Andrew, his brother, James, uh, or Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. All right, so we've, many of us have probably read that before, but let me ask you, which of those 12 apostles, which one, and I'm not going to let you, you can't raise your hand and I'm going to pick on you to answer. Which one was known as the doubting disciple? Now raise your, don't say it out loud. Who was the doubting disciple out of these 12? Okay, so I have way in the very back. Yes. Thomas. All right, that's correct. See, I knew you guys were smart. You guys got the first answer right, just like that. Okay, so Thomas. Okay, uh, here's a little bit harder question. What two disciples were cousins to Jesus? What two disciples were Jesus' cousins? He actually chose two of his cousins to be part of the 12 apostles, two of his cousins. All right. Yes. Well, James is correct for one of them, um, but it's not James, uh, uh, son of Zebedee. James and John were sons of Zebedee. Uh, but it was James, the son of Alphaeus. Al uh, Alphaeus was, was, believe it or not, Jesus' uncle. All right. And the other one was, hard, pr hard to pronounce, Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Aren't you glad you don't have the name Thaddeus? What is your name? That is your Libius. But, you know, uh, they misspell people's names all the time, but having the name of Libius, I don't think anybody could spell that correctly. You know, how do you spell that? You know, uh, my last name has always been misspelled. It's Mac Cormac, and they always, it's been misspelled since I was in kindergarten, so I've kind of used to it. But uh, those are the cousins of Jesus, all right? Um, who were the sons of thunder? The sons of thunder. Tell me. John's and Jane, you got that one, okay? So you guys are smart, I tell you. All right, so uh, James and John, who was the tax collector? Kind of, scripture kind of tells us a little hint there, yes? Yeah. Matthew, you got it. Matthew, all right. Who was the most trusted disciple? Out of those 12, who was the most trusted? The most trusted. All right, this might, might trick you here. Who was the most trusted? You want to, Judas, which one? Oh, she is, you guys are smart here. All right, you're one of the first group of people that got that correct. Uh, Judas Iscariot was the most trusted disciple. I said, oh, wait a minute, I thought Judas Iscariot was the one that betrayed Jesus. He was the one that carried the bag. He was the treasurer. If you were to choose a treasurer here at Packerville Baptist Church, who would you choose? Now you say, well, I know who I wouldn't choose. <laughs> but you would choose someone here that you had trusted, that you knew, that kept the money, was honest and upright. So the, per the, the person that you would least likely think would, that would betray Jesus was Judas Iscariot. When Jesus said to uh, uh, Judas, go and do uh, what thou needest to do quickly, they thought he was going to, to maybe give a donation to the poor or maybe uh, 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 feed the poor or do something with the money to help somebody with. They had to help because he was always administering the money to help people with. They didn't know he was going out to betray Jesus Christ. They, and, when they, and when he came there with the group of soldiers and betrayed Jesus with a kiss, the other disciples were in shock. It's in shock. You ever you know, see one of these TV news editorials and you just are shocked about some of the things that happen in this world? You cannot believe it. But there's all kinds of craziness going on in this world. And Judas Iscariot was the most trusted disciple of the one that betrayed Jesus Christ. All right? Who is the least likely to succeed? The least likely apostle to succeed? Who wants to try that one? Who said that? You got it, correct. Peter. Uh, Peter was the least likely to succeed. Why? He was always putting his foot in his mouth, always messing up, always saying the right, wrong things and do it. Uh, and of course, he was the one that denied Jesus three times in cursed and swore and denied. He was in a corner. They thought that he was gonna, uh, he, they were going to arrest him. And he said, I don't know that man. You know, and then the, the, last of all, the, the, the maid came to the fire and said, well, 
I know you're one of those disciples because you have the accent like those fishermen, like those Nazarene people. And so he wanted to disguise his accent. He started cursing and swearing. He said, I don't know that man. And right then the, the cock crew, you know, the, the, the second time, and he denied Christ three times, and he went out and wept bitterly, as, as our Sunday school lesson talked about this morning. Um, so later on, Peter was allowed to make up for his failures by preaching on the day of Pentecost with, where 3,000 people received Christ as your Savior. So if anyone knows anything about growing in grace and in knowledge, who do you think knows more about that than any other apostle? The apostle Peter, because he, he was the most likely to, 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 he was a failure. He messed up so many times and he had to learn how to grow in grace and in knowledge. So today's message is entitled, Growing in Grace and Knowledge. So sometimes you might be here today and say, well, you know, you know, I'm not that great of a Christian or, you know, maybe I'm not even a Christian and I don't think I could become a Christian because I couldn't be as good as so-and-so. And you have all these excuses in your mind thinking, how can I really do anything for God? Well, God takes things that you wouldn't think would be anything and he makes them into something great. In fact, God prefers to choose someone that's the least and make them into the greatest. Why? Because who gets more glory? God does. If you're already great and you're wonderful and then God saves you, God's going to say, well, that guy's going to try to take some of the credit. So God chooses those that are the least likely to be saved, the least likely to succeed, the, the sinners out there that you would never imagine to become saved. And so you say, wow, that guy's a drug addict and he's an alcoholic or man, he's a thief and he's really a loser. God wants them to be saved. Of course, God wants everyone to be saved. But sometimes the righteous, those of us that maybe, you know, live good and are proper, and are proper rearing, sometimes we think, you know, we're pretty good. You know, do I really need God? You know, I think I'm a Christian anyway. I was born a Christian. You know, I was baptized a Christian. And sometimes those people don't ever get saved because they're trusting in themselves, their own self-righteousness. Whereas today, if you come humbly before God, say, God, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a failure, Lord. I really need your help. Please help me to grow in grace. Lord, please help me to do your will. Help, help me to accomplish something in life before I die that will bring glory to your name. Those are the ones that God is seeking to. God is seeking to those who have a meek and quiet spirit, those that are humble. Throughout the Scripture, if you read through the Scriptures, God is seeking those. His Holy Spirit searches the earth looking for those that are humble and are, are, are seeking Him and are, are realize that they don't have it all what, what takes it to, to make it. So today, if you have a humble spirit, God can use you to grow in grace and do something for His glory. So I'm going to give you four steps, four quick steps, not long steps, but four quick steps on how to grow in grace and knowledge as a Christian. First of all, uh, for all of us to grow in grace and knowledge, you have to be born again as a babe in Christ. You can't grow unless you're born, right? You have, you have to be actually, first of all, born and born again in Christ. Jesus tells us how to be born again in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. This is the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, but he came to Jesus at night because he's afraid that the other Pharisee friends would kind of look down on him. And, but he really wanted to know the answer. He was seeking for the truth. And this is where we get the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's right in the scripture. So if you're here today seeking salvation or seeking to be born again, you're not sure, this is the scripture to look at. So I'm just going to quickly read uh, John 3, 1 through 16. And we're going to see where you have to be born again to begin to grow in grace. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we, we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And everyone read with me out loud. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, now that I know you're all awake, all right, let's proceed. All right, but we see here that most of us here today would probably say you're born again. If I were to go around and interview each one of you, say, yes, I'm born again, I'm saved. I got saved when I was younger or whatever age testimony we heard of uh, Linda's testimony today about her husband and how his testimony, she came to Christ. Um, and so I would say most of you here today are probably born again. I'm not going to go around and think, well, I'm preaching to a bunch of unsaved people here today. Uh, but if you're, if you're not, I will give you an opportunity at the end of the service to receive Christ as your Savior. Uh, if you have doubts, you might ask, well, how do I know if I am born again as a babe in Christ? So you might be born again, but sometimes you have doubts. Have you, have you ever had doubts of a Christian? I've had doubts as a Christian. When I was younger, even sometimes you get older, you say, God, am I really saved? Am I really, you know, is this all true? Am I going to go to heaven? Doubts come once in a while to, to all of us. But, you know, I'm going to show you that you can have a concrete fact that you know you're saved if you show signs that you were growing in grace and in knowledge. You can, you'll, you'll have signs. Uh, so, so we're going right into the second step here. You will have a strong desire to drink the milk of God's Word. If you're born again, you're going to have a strong desire to drink the milk of God's Word. God's Word is likened unto milk and food. All right, so turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Back to our, our text. We were in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look over to 1 Peter chapter 2, toward the very end of the Bible just before uh, Revelation and, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, to the, the book of Peter once again, because remember, Peter was the one that knew how to grow more than anybody else, because he had messed up more than anybody else. Any other apostle, he had really messed up. So he knows all this about growing as a baby and growing and maturing in Christ. So if you want to learn how to grow in Christ, look at the book of Peter, 1st Peter and 2nd Peter. So 1st uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 tells us about growing uh, as a babe in Christ. Okay, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse, starting with verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sinful milk, uh, milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you're truly born again, you're going to hunger and thirst after the Word of God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have you ever seen a baby wake up from a nap and not be uh, thirsty or hungry? You know, have you ever uh, seen that? When our two boys were babies and it was feeding time, you couldn't refill the, the baby bo bottle fast enough. I mean, they don't remember that. They go, oh, I remember mom feeding me or dad feeding me. My wife would always have three or four bottles uh, of milk ready at all times. <laughs> they wanted more. They keep on crying, want more and more. Now, if you ever did see a baby that was not thirsty or not hungry after they woke up from the nap, there only can be only two reasons why that would be the case. One, that baby was very sick and didn't, didn't feel like eating. All right, that baby didn't feel like eating or drinking because the baby was very sick, or that baby was dead. There's only two results. It's just like scientific. If your baby doesn't want, want to eat after it woke up from the snap, it's either very sick or it's dead. You know? So if you're here today, you might be born again. You might be born again, but if you're not hungry and thirsty right now for the Word of God, you might be sick spiritually. You, so can Christians get sick spiritually? Can they, yeah, Christians can get sick spiritually. You can become a sick Christian. 
I'm not talking about, oh man, you're sick. You know, you're sick spiritually. You can become a sick Christian because you let the worldly things uh, of this day and age crowd out the desires for God's Word. And so if you if I ask you, are you, do you have a hunger and thirst for God? Well, not really. I used to, but I don't, I'm not really that hungry right now or thirsty for God's Word. I don't really read it that much and study it. You, well, you're, you're probably at, you probably have a spiritual sickness. You're maybe saved, you're born again. But if you say, well, no, I don't, I'm, not sure, I'm not really sick, then you might be dead. You might be still dead in your trespasses and sins. That's how you can tell. So step number one, you have to be born again to grow. Number two, if you are born again, if you don't have a desire for the milk and, uh, and the Word of God, or you're still dead in your trespassing and sins. So if you meet somebody say, I don't really care about going to church, I don't care about reading the Bible, I don't care about anything about God, they're either sick spiritually, backslidden from God, or they're, they're not saved. You know, I don't, I don't want to judge people, and I don't go around judging people. But you personally have to know that. You have to know in your inner heart, do you have a, a true desire to learn God's Word and to study God's Word and to grow from God's Word, all right? So you have to understand that. So uh, using that same comparison, uh, if you don't have an appetite for spiritual things, you're either sick spiritually and have gotten away from your walk with the Lord, or you are still dead in your trespasses and sins and need to get born again as a babe in Christ. Point number three, next step. You will want to eat the meat of God's Word. So first of all, drink the milk of God's Word. Number three, you want to eat the meat of God's Word. Jeremiah 15, 16, don't turn there, but it says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Uh, a favorite scripture of mine, David said in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. If you love God's Word and you're growing in the Scriptures, you're going to be thinking about God's Word all day long. You're going to be thinking, oh, that Scripture there. Whenever something comes up, you, the Scripture's going to pop in your head for the answer. The Scripture's like the answer for everything. You're going to, that's, as a Christian, that's going to be happening. How do I know if a Christian is growing and maturing? They have a ferocious appetite for the Word of God. You know, the, the larger uh, a child gets, he goes from baby stage to toddler stage to, to, you know, to uh, the other stages, they get hungrier and hungrier, more hungry, uh, until they get like us, and you know, we don't, we're not that hungry. Guys, us older men, we kind of lose our appetite. Women, is that true? <laughs> we're probably all still hungry. Uh, my favorite restaurant um, uh, for baby back ribs is, in, is Chili's. Uh, anybody else like uh, uh, baby back ribs here? Uh, anyone else like that? Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. When our two boys, Justin and Jaden, hit age 10, uh, they began to eat everything in sight. And now they're, now they're uh, 12 and 13, or 11 and, 11 and 13, or Justin, Justin's going to be a 13 in another week or two. Um, a few weeks ago, our family just ate a big meal at a restaurant, and I asked permission for Jaden to let me say this. Uh, no sooner had we driven out of the parking lot, Jaden said, Dad, can we stop by Dunkin' Donuts and, uh, and have a snack on the way home? I said, we just ate, we just ate a huge meal. <laughs> he wanted me to stop by Dunkin' Donuts. And my mom said, of course not. We just finished uh, eating all that food over at the restaurant. So uh, uh, talking about food, uh, uh, my favorite uh, baby back ribs is that Chili's. I will not eat, I promise you, I will not eat any other baby back ribs unless I'm, you know, at some gathering and you feed me baby back ribs. I'll just eat it. But, you know, I'll try to enjoy it, but I probably won't because the best baby back ribs are at Chili's. They serve... Uh, they serve the best ones I've ever had uh, where, in all my travels and places. Uh, I'll, they serve it as a full rack and as a half rack. Now, Chili's is sponsoring my, my ministry. Do you hear that? <laughs> they told me that to say it. <laughs> they gave me a little, little monthly kickback for saying all this stuff. Wherever, wherever I go, I put this section to my sermon. I somehow, even if I'm preaching a different uh, topic, I stick this little section in here. No, I'm teasing. Okay, so um, I, I usually get a half rack uh, you know, for lunch. Uh, but for supper or, or family out with dinner, I usually get a full rack of ribs. Uh, and if, you, if I go there, I, I don't really eat anything else at Chili's other than a rack of ribs, a half rack or full rack. It says, what do you want, Steve? Full rack, half rack. You know, if I go there, that's what I'm going to get. I don't even have to look at the menu. Like, what do you want? You want I don't need a menu. Um, a couple years ago, after the boys finished the, their kids' meals, they were eating the kids' meals there, 
uh, they would ask to taste uh, a few of my ribs. So I was always giving them some of my ribs. You know, I said, oh, Dad, can I have a couple of those ribs, please? This is the last couple of years as I get this more stronger and stronger appetite. You know, I'm giving half my, all of a sudden I'm, like, I'm left with three ribs here. I go, is that a meal? <laughs> you know, I just start ordering two full racks you know, to give, give more weight to them. All right. Uh, I said, so a couple of years ago, uh, um, and when, they, when they finished their meal, they would ask to eat some few ribs. Uh, uh, guess what my older son, Justin, wanted for his birthday meal out last year? He, you know, his birthday meal out. He said, Dad, for my birthday meal out, I want to go to Chili's and have a full rack of ribs. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding. I said, okay, we'll take you out. We went out there and he ordered this full rack of ribs there. You know, and he, he ate all those ribs there. Guess what my younger son, Jaden, wanted this last May, just a few months ago, for his birthday meal out? He goes, Dad, I want a, a full rack of ribs at Chili's too. <laughs> we, brought, we brought him over there to Chili's and get, he ordered that. Uh, when he was served his full rack of ribs, can you believe he ate the whole rack in just in less than five minutes? I couldn't believe it. I said, uh, I, said I, I had hardly even started my meal and sometimes wondered uh, if, I sometimes I wonder if my, my son is part piranha or something like that, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> eats those. So uh, as a Christian, you need to know that your appetite for the Word of God is, is like that. You have, to, you have to be able to have that hunger and thirst for righteousness. If, if you're losing that, it means you're sliding away from the Lord or there's something wrong. You may not be really saved because as a Christian, you're going to want to read the Word and, and meditate on it. You're going to read it. You want to memorize it. You want to hear it when it's preached. You want to share it with others in testimony. Like this brother you know, read some scriptures for his testimony earlier. You want to witness and tell people about it. That's what a Christian does. Um, so my last point, finally, you will become a teacher of God's word. Number four, verse, uh, uh, point four, turn to Hebrews chapter five. This is in conclusion. If you're, if you're growing in grace, your final destination is that you, you will, you will, I don't say may, you will become a teacher of God's word. You say, well, I'm afraid of teaching. I don't like, well, you, the, the drive within you, you'll become. So Hebrews is just before Peter. So if you were in Peter and then went a few pages before that, you come to uh, uh, James and then you come to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Now it's, it's believed that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, but Hebrews chapter 5, and I want you to look down to verse 11 because we're talking about the meat of God's word. And and Paul was one that, you know, was a great teacher, but he also, you know, was very stern with the church when they got out of line. And, and a lot of the Hebrews back then, they were getting out of line with God. And so in verse 11, he says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. He said, you know, a bunch of you Hebrews out there at the church there in Jerusalem, you've kind of gotten dull to hear the word of God. You kind of got used to, you want, you want somebody to kind of entertain you rather than teach you. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Growing Christians are like a pond or a reservoir. If you keep taking in and never give out, what happens to that pond? It becomes stagnant, starts to stink, becomes like a swamp. But a pond for it to be properly maintained, it has a river coming in and you have an inlet or outlet on the other side to let that water keep on flowing. As a believer in Christ, as you're growing and you're trying to take in the word, uh, from the milk and also from the meat of God's word, you have to be able to get it out to others. And what is, what is Satan's plan? Satan's plan, his devices are to stop the word of God from flowing. He wants the church to become a stagnant, stinking swamp. And if you go around to most churches today, many of them are just stinking swamps. There's so much bickering and fighting and division and people are worldly and they don't praise God. They complain and if someone's an unbeliever, they say, well, why would I want to become a Christian? You know, uh, the biggest reason why I, I, what I get when I go out witnessing, so I would be, I would become a Christian, but the, but the, the church is full of, and what's the word? You, you know that? 
that, that's what they tell me all the time. I go out there, they say, I would become a Christian, but the church is just so full of hypocrites. Why? Because they're not growing. They're, they're becoming stagnant. They're becoming stagnant. When you, when you don't have something to do in the church, what happens? You start picking at each other. You're not out there working together to, for a common goal to help others and to get the gospel out. You start picking at each other, and all of a sudden, that's where the hypocrites become. And, and the devil wants it to happen. But if we're going to be used of God in our Christian life, we have to be, first of all, born again. You can't start off without being born again. So if anybody here is not born again, you have to be born again to be able to grow. Secondly, you have to take in the, uh, the milk of God's Word. You have to have the milk of God. You have to start off the basics. You say, well, I used to know those basics. I kind of got rusty on those basic things. Take a refresher course. You know, they, they require you, if you, if you uh, are in some special services for the state of Connecticut and other states, they, have to, they make you take continuing education. Why do they have that? Because sometimes you forget some of those refresher courses. And so they have you take continuing ed to help you remember those basics. But thirdly, you have to, you have to say, you have to start eating the, the meat. If my two boys were only drinking milk, my mom would say, oh, well, what do you got for lunch today? Milk. What do you got for supper? Milk. They'd be probably like, you know, still only 50 pounds each, you know. Uh, they had to start eating meat and other foods. The same thing, if all you had was, if all I gave you was just really basic messages from God's Word and never really taught you the, the meat of God's Word and some complex things about growing, you would, you would still be alive, but you wouldn't be very healthy. You wouldn't be very strong to get out there to do anything. So you have to have the meat of God's Word. You say, well, you know, I don't really like to study. Well, I tell my boys, I say, if you don't study that, that math and that science and that English, you're not going to be able to pass and get, you know, a good job. Same thing. If you don't learn the Word of God and learn some of those hard things in there, you're not going to accomplish anything for God. And when you get, you say, well, I don't know. I'm just doing the best I can. When you get before God in, in heaven, he starts giving out the awards, the crowns, and the, and, and the things that he does. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you haven't done much for the Lord guess what? Time is up. You don't have any more second chances to go back to the earth. Oh, God, let's give me my wings, and I'll fly down there, and I'll start doing a bunch of good little deeds here. You know, the, the, the Hollywood likes to do that, you know. You, you have to get your wings. You can fly down here, and God lets you make up some time that you didn't do it while you were on earth. That doesn't happen. When you, get to, when you die and go to heaven as a Christian, your time of doing good deeds on the earth for rewards are over. You say, well, why do I want rewards in heaven? Because you want to cast it at the feet of Jesus. Don't you want to be able to get, if you go to a wedding, do you go to a wedding empty-handed? No, you try, well, I got to go to that, if I, I'm not going to that wedding unless I have a gift. I'm not going to that birthday party if I don't have a gift. You feel embarrassed because, well, I'm here for the cake. <laughs> you know, you know, I, might be, I might be there for that, but you know, if you don't have a gift, you feel embarrassed if you don't have that gift at the wedding. So then when you get to heaven, you're going to be a mighty embarrassed believer in Christ without a gift or without much of any gifts to give him. My goal as a Christian is to get as many gifts and crowns. So when I get there, I'm going to cast a truckload at Jesus' feet. Say, Lord, thank you for saving my soul. I know I'm unworthy to be here, but Lord, because of your grace, I was able to do this for you for your grace. And here's all these rewards I'm casting at your feet. I want to see every believer to be able to do that. I want to do that myself. I want everyone to do that. Because that's when you're going to really rejoice in heaven because you accomplished something for God. And if you're about busy doing that, you're not going to be fighting and bickering and, and being a bunch of hypocrites. You're going to be out there saying, okay, we got to do good here. We got to do that. The Bible says this. We got to do that. You're going to be following the scriptures. People say, boy, that church is alive. That church is really reaching out to the community. That, that church is helping people. That's making a difference. But see, the devil doesn't want that to happen. The devil wants to stop us dead in our tracks. But we have to grow in grace and in knowledge. Not just in grace, but knowledge. And that's by studying God's Word. The great commission that Jesus gave us was found, the last words, and we read today the last written words of Peter, the last words of, of Jesus before he actually went to heaven. Of course, he came back, uh, uh, um, he was on earth after his uh, crucifixion, when he was ascended on the Mount Olive, uh, Olivet. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That was called the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. If those were Jesus' last words before he went to heaven, what do you think our job is as Christians? To go into all nations, wherever we can, 
and teach all nations and to baptize them and to teach them whatsoever he's commanded us. Now, if you tell me, well, you know, he told me here to sing beautiful music. I love music. I play a musical instrument. I love to sing. But God didn't tell us to be great musicians or great singers. He said, well, I love going out and just, you know, having big, you know, uh, banquets. You know, I'm going to be like the pilgrims. We're going to feed all, all the Indians and everybody else in town. Well, I love helping poor people and helping people in general. But he said to go and preach the gospel. So we as believers have to follow that great commission. So I have, uh, in my invitation, I have three things for each one of you to take with you today. Number one, if you're not saved, get born again. Get born again. If you're not saved, get born again. If you're going to grow in grace and knowledge, you have to get born again. Number two, if you are saved, you need to renew your hunger and thirst for God's Word. We all get, kind of get lax at times, but you need to read it more. You need to memorize it more. You need to hear God's Word as much as you can and to share your testimony and witness wherever you can. And then last of all, if you are a believer and you are trying to study God's Word and you know somewhat of the Scriptures, you need to volunteer to teach Sunday school, a youth group, a Bible study, maybe one of the uh, nursing home ministries, and somehow use your capacity to teach God's Word to help others because then you will truly grow in grace and a knowledge of God uh, uh, in, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let's bow our heads and pray now. And I'm just going to have a moment of invitation. If you're here today and, and the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you said, Pastor McCormick, you know, uh, I listened to the message today and I, I truly have some doubts about my salvation. I'm not sure if I'm born again, but I'd really like to know for sure that I'm born again. And, you're, and everyone's heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. And you would raise your hand and say, Pastor McCormick, would you please pray for me that I might know for sure that I'm saved, that I know for sure that I'm born again. You're not sure right now, but you'd like to be. Just raise your hand and I'll, I'll just mention you in my prayer, not, not your name, but I was thinking in my heart and to the Lord. Just raise your hand. I see one hand back there. Anybody else say, Pastor, pray for me. Another hand. I'm not really sure if I'm saved. Another hand. Please pray for me. I can know for sure that I'm born again. Another hand there. All right, anybody else? Okay. Uh, Everyone close your eyes. If you're there, right in your heart, and, you're, and we're in the church today, God, God is in control of all things. And you, if you know the scripture that he, he died on the cross, was buried and rose again, in your heart you can call upon his name today and ask him to save you. That's all salvation is, is your faith 100% in Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you raise your hand, you're not sure, I want you to say this prayer to the Lord in your heart. And... And then if you truly meant it, you can make a testimony later on today, if you like, that you prayed that and asked Christ to save you. So just pray this in your heart. Just say this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, the best I know how, I receive Jesus Christ right now as my personal Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and save my soul. I believe in you, Lord, that you died, was buried, and rose again for my salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you were one of those people today that prayed that during the invitation, I'm going to give you an opportunity. You don't have to do this, but if you're truly saved, you don't want other people to know about it. When we have the invitation, I want you to come forward and just say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer, and I don't want people to know that I prayed and I made sure I'm saved today. I made sure I'm born again. And, you, and that reassures your salvation. You say, well, maybe I really was saved 10 years ago. You might have been, but you have to, you have to eliminate those doubts the devil's put in your heart because the devil doesn't want you to grow. If he can make you doubt right now, you'll never grow as a Christian because you'll say, well, am I, am I really saved or not? I'm not really sure. You'll never know to, to, for sure unless you pray that prayer right now and eliminate those doubts. My brother uh, got saved when he was younger, but when he was in Bible college, he's a preacher down in Dothan, Alabama, has a church of 350 members in a Christian school. He's been preaching there for 25 years. But while he was in Bible college, he had doubts. He got saved again, so to speak, and got baptized there at the church when he was like 20 years old. But he had, he had all these doubts. So at the in invitation today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to maybe make a profession of faith if you did that. But if you're a believer and you, you want to just come forward today and just maybe kneel and pray and just say, Lord, I'm just rededicating my love for your word today and rededicate myself to, to read the Bible more, to memorize it, and to maybe share it more. 
Or maybe you're already doing that. You say, I want to volunteer. There might not be any openings for a, a class, but I'm sure some of the leaders here could make up a class, right? <laughs> you can make up a class. You might volunteer and say, I would like to teach God's Word. I am a believer and I know the Scriptures, but I want to help out in teaching the Bible more at the Packerville Baptist Church.